It's requested that all participants of this meeting turn their mobile phones to off or silent. Hopefully those present will hear the meeting. However, in the event of a technical failure, the chairman will adjourn the meeting and set a new time to reinstate the meeting. Please note that the meeting is being recorded. All those present will remain muted until the chairman allows them to speak. Only members of the public that have registered to speak can make representation to the committee. The format of the meeting will be as per the agenda published and a copy of the Office of Presentations can be found on the committee website. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. Uh, I'm Councillor Filmer, Chairman of the committee. Um, just a few uh, notes before we get on to the agenda itself uh, and particularly about the process that will follow this morning. Um, we'll take each application in turn. The officers will outline the applications before us and that will be followed by a public speaking time. The members will then debate and decide on the applications before us. For members of the committee, uh, for those of you who wish to speak, can I just please remind you to indicate via the online chat and I'll call you in turn. Uh, during the debate, there will be a proposer and a seconder for a resolution. The members will then vote on this proposal in turn and they will have to also confirm whether they were present throughout the application and will then vote for, against or abstain. The votes will then be counted and the result announced. I'll now uh, ask the officers and councillors who will be taking part in the meeting this morning uh, just to confirm that they can see and hear me and to introduce themselves. So if we start with the, the planning officers and uh, we'll start with Adrian Noon. Yes, hello there. My name's Adrian Noon. I am the principal planning officer for the East and I will be the lead officer today uh, to help the presenting officers as necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if we then come to Emma Chorley. Good morning. Yeah, my name is Emma Chorley. I'm one of the senior officers in the East team. Um, I can see and hear everything today. Thank you. And Amelia Elvey. Thank you, Chairman. Hello. Yes, I'm Amelia Elvey. I am a planning officer. Thank you very much. And then from our legal section, we have uh, Dawn Lehman. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Dawn Lehman, Legal Services. I am the advisor to the committee and I can confirm that I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. And from our Democratic Services, Leila Nicholson. Good morning. My name is Leila Nicholson. I'm the committee manager for today's meeting. I can confirm that I can see and hear everyone. Thank you very much. And if we then come on to the members of the committee, starting with Councillor Granter. Is Councillor Granter present? OK, we'll move on to Councillor Glassford and we'll come back to Councillor Granter. Good morning, everyone. I am. Councillor Alec Glassford representing Fairfax Ward Bridgewater. I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pierce. Um, thank you. Good morning. It's Councillor Kathy Pierce here with Stover Ward Bridgewater. Am I echoing? I think I need to come out and come back in again. OK, well, thank you, Councillor Pearson. We'll, we'll just confirm once you come back in that you can hear us a bit clearer. Uh, let's move on then to Councillor Gibson. Yeah, good morning, uh, Councillor Gibson from East Clover Bridgewater. And um, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Councillor Scott. Yes, good morning, Chairman and everyone. It's Councillor Liz Scott here from the Axvale Ward near Axbridge. Can confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hendry. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Sedgemoor District Councillor Alistair Hendry, Burnham on Sea Central. And yes, I confirm I can see and hear everything clearly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Facey. Yeah, good morning, Chairman, Councillor Mike Facey, Burnham on Sea North. I can see and hear all, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy, I think you might be still on mute. Apologies, Chair, I switched it off and uh, it's been switched back on again. Um, good morning, Councillor Mike Murphy here representing Burnham North. 
and I can see and hear you. Thank you, Councillor Kingham. Yeah, good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Yes, Councillor Stuart Kingham of West Poldens Ward, and I can hear and see all. Councillor Bradford. Councillor Bradford, we can't hear you at the moment. I'm here, Mr. Chairman. That's better. We can hear you now. I had that thing stuck in me air and not in my mouth. I could believe it. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Committee. Good morning, officers. Um, Councillor Alan Bradford, representing North Petherton. Am I going to hear and see everyone quite clearly? Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Councillor Bolt. Good morning. Uh, Brian Bolt, Ward Member for Cannington and Wembden. I can see and hear the meeting. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, good morning. Councillor Liz Perry, uh, representing the Kings Isle Ward, and I can confirm I can hear and see everything. And Councillor Grimes. Good morning, everybody. Councillor Tony Grimes, Deputy Chairman, uh, representing Barrow and Bream Ward. I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. If we go back to Councillor Granter. Oh, OK, and then we'll just go back to Councillor Pierce to make sure if, if Councillor Pierce is reconnected. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I think I was in twice. Um, yes, <laughs> Councillor Cathy Pierce, Westover Ward, Bridgewater. I confirm I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you're, you're much clearer at that time, so that's fine. Uh, and I'm Councillor Filmer and Chairman of the committee, and I've also seen and heard all the members who've responded and, and officers. <coughs> uh, just to also mention, we obviously have with us a number of members of the public today, some of whom we've registered to speak, some of whom are here as, as observers. And we also have with us some councillors who again are here to either address us or, or alternatively just to observe the meeting. So if we move on then to the agenda itself, do we have any apologies for absence, please? Thank you, Chairman. We've received apologies from Councillor Bill Revens. Um, I'm not sure what's happened to Councillor Grant because he was here and then he went on hold. Um, so whether he's got a, a technical issue as well. So we'll, if he comes in, I'll let you know. OK, thank you very much. That and all other members are present, so um, we'll move on to item two, which is the minutes of the previous meetings. Uh, what we'll do is we'll take these in in turn uh, and uh, to see if there are any amendments to those. So if we start, uh, Mr Nicholson, I think with the 15th of September, any amendments that we've got for that? Mrs Nicholson. Sorry, I didn't realise you were actually talking to me. That's um, right. uh, no, no, is the answer fine. to that one. Sorry. Any amendments from members, if you could indicate if there are any suggested amendments. I'm not seeing anything from members, so uh, what we'll do is, is I'll ask if there's any members who disagree with those minutes or disagree with the fact of assigning them as a true and accurate record. If you could indicate now, and if not, we'll take that as clear that they are a true and accurate record. Again, I'm not seeing any indications, so we will accept those minutes for the 15th of September. We then move to the minutes for the 8th of November. 10th of November. Uh, I've got the 8th of November on my agenda, but anyway, it doesn't um, matter if it's sorry, the 10th. Sorry, beg It's the 10th of November. Um, there, there's an amendment to the um, declaration of interest, uh, just the one, and that's for yourself. Um, and it should now read uh, ward. The reason that you're given a personal interest is the ward councillor and member of Brentnell Parish Council, but took no part in discussions on the application. Applicant is also known, but no close association. Thank you. Are there any other amendments that any other members have? Again, then I'm going to ask if, if there's anyone who disagrees with the minutes, if they could indicate now and I'm seeing no indication so again we'll take those amended minutes as a true and accurate record that then moves us on to the minutes of the 8th of December again are we aware of any amendments that any 
one's brought forward. No, Mrs. Nicholson's yep. shaking your head. Thank you. Again, members, any amendments that you have? Not seeing any. So again, anyone who disagrees with those minutes, please indicate now. Okay, no one's indicating, so that is taken as a true and accurate record. And the final set that we have before us today are the 10th of December. We're not aware of any amendments that have come in previously. So again, members, any amendments that you have declare now, please. I'm not seeing anything. So again, unless I see any further comment from members, we'll take those as a true and accurate record. <clears throat> Sorry about that. that is, we'll take that as a true and accurate record then of those me meeting on the 10th of December. That brings us on to item three on the agenda, which is urgent business. I'm not being advised of any urgent business which isn't already covered on our agenda. Item four is public speaking time. Uh, for members of the public, for those of you who've registered to speak this morning, as I mentioned earlier, we'll take the applications in turn. The officers will then outline the detail and background to the application. Once we've heard that, I will then ask the speakers to address the committee. Uh, just to remind you, you have three minutes in which to do so. And once two minutes of that have passed, you'll hear a bell to indicate that you've got one minute left to go. And Mrs Nicholson, if you could just demonstrate the bell. Excellent, thank you. So once you've heard that bell again, just to remind you, you'll have one minute left to draw your comments to a close. And obviously, if you can do that within the time, that would be most appreciated. So we'll move on then to any declarations of interest that members have on the items of the agenda before us today. Again, if you could indicate in the chat if you have any declarations. I'm seeing no declarations at all. OK, that's fine. Uh, for members, oh, we have Councillor Kingham. You're on mute, Councillor Kingham. Yeah, I know. I know. Sorry. Trying to get, turn it off. Yeah, just um, realise that there's um, one in store, Bridgewater, um, on page 15, which is part of my ward. Um, I've taken no part in any discussions of, of that plan application. Thank you very much. Uh, for members of the public, it's important that you know if there's any background that, that members have on a particular application. Uh, where you've heard the declaration that you've you've just heard from Councillor Kingham, we have a standing order within this committee which basically says to avoid members making their mind up before they come to this committee in what's called predetermination, that they should make a decision either that they can get involved at the district council level at this committee, or they can be involved at the parish and town council level, but they can't do both because the danger is if they've been seen to make a decision at the town and parish level, that could be perceived that they've already made their mind up before they come here. So on that basis. As you've heard in this case, Councillor Kingham has, has declared that he took no part at the parish and town so that he can come along and, and be involved in the decision making and voting on the applications before us today. If we move then on to the next item, which is the schedule of alleged contraventions, I've not been advised in advance that any members have raised any issues on this, this report, so we'll take that as an item of, of note. Again, as I was always say to members, if, if you do have an issue relating to enforcement that's on the sheet, do contact the team. They're, they're very happy to uh, to discuss matters and, and how they're proceeding. Um, so if, if you can do that, that would be uh, would be very much appreciated. I'm not seeing anything else on that one, so we'll move on to the next item, which are the uh, planning applications before us this morning. So if members, if you can turn to page one of your reports where we have speakers present. Uh, we move to Wedmore and Emma Chorley, I think you're uh, presenting this one for us, please. Good morning. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, let me just um, share my screen one moment. OK, can everyone see that one? Yep, that's certainly up on the screen. OK, so here we have an outline application with some matters reserved for the erection of a self-built dwelling at the Hill Mill Lane in Wedmore. 
the application was previously brought to committee on the 10th of December uh, 2020. Following publication of the officer's report, further comments had been received regarding uh, scale and ecology, and a request was made for committee members to defer the application to allow amendments to be made and reconsultation. Uh, the scale was removed, so we're now looking purely at the principle of the proposal together with the detail of access and a col an additional ecology condition has been applied and that's uh, referred to within the officer's report. Um, amended plans were consulted on for 14 days, further comments have been received um, and they again are detailed in the officer's report uh, and as I say the only detail before us today is access. Um, subsequent to the agenda being published, we have had some further comments. I think my colleague uh, Adrian Noon was going to uh, address those. I don't know if you want to do that now, Adrian, or uh, or after the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Noon. I, I probably make make yes, it would make sense if if we could just put up the aerial photograph of the slide so members can see. There we go. Thank you. Um, We've had letters from uh, two, uh, one resident whose unfortunately uh, submission made just before Christmas wasn't received at our end and wasn't recorded uh, on our on that is now being rectified. She's provided a uh, a copy of that and that is now on the system. The concerns she raised at Mr. the time Noon, could I, was could I just interrupt you for one moment? If it might be worth you thinking about turning your camera off because your 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 audio is breaking up. It might help if if you just try with just the audio, and hopefully that will make it a bit clearer. Okay, apologies. Um, so concern concern was raised in that letter um, that the removal of the scale from the consideration, leaving the only access to be considered. Um, was confusing. Uh, the writer felt that the scale was likely to be excessive, uh, as noted in the objections, and felt that the scale is relevant um, because of the, the constraints of the site and, and should should be included now. Um, sh the, the, that writer has also provided a late comment um, very recently, just pointing out that the the owner of the adjoining bungalow to the left of the site on the screen there um, did in fact die in May 2020, which would explain why we have received no comments from that bungalow. Uh, this application was submitted in August, so I think it you know, obviously um, came in after that, that sad event. Um, but our, the lady who's written in uh, pointing this out does sort of underline that the occupier there was, what, you know, was very fond of watching the wildlife in the surrounding area and you know it is felt that she would not have supported this application although obviously um, that is the view of the writer that we have received the letter from and then finally there is a letter gone to all members of the committee signed by a number of local residents um, just taking issue with a number of points uh, that are raised in the officer report and reiterating an, a number of concerns that have been raised locally, summarised as the fact that the development site is outside um, outside of the development boundary on a prominent and sensitive hillside, that the location is detrimental, uh, would have detrimental visual impacts, uh, which is worse than another application the, app the applicant made off just just to the uh, right on the very right hand edge of the screen at the other end of the field. Now, obviously, that's a separate site was considered separately and has no um, material consideration on this application, which is just want to point that out that it's two separate sites with different strands of planning history. Um, concerns about misleading plans and the design statement seeking to underplay the true scale of the proposal well i've just you know those are now you know effectively reserved matters so we're looking here at just whether or not the site is of a sufficient size in principle to accommodate a dwelling and whether or not the location is acceptable in like a policies which uh, mrs chorley will run through in her presentation um it's identified that it's an important ridge line uh, referred to in the Wed Wedmore Village design statement with the and with the potential to adversely impact on the neighbor neighboring amenity. The fear that bulk and massing would be out of character. Um, uh, act safe access couldn't be achieved with on site parking. And there's also a fear that the development of this site would overlook uh, the adjoining properties. Now, these these are issues that have all been raised previously 
obviously they are reiterated in this letter, um, but they are all uh, reported in the officer report and addressed in that report. So if I can hand back to Mrs Chorley, um, that, that, that those are the updates from late representations. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs Chorley. Thank you. Uh, just further to that, uh, one additional update from when the report was uh, was published, uh, self-build condition would need to be applied in the event that permission was granted. Um, that's set out there so everyone can see, but it's just to ensure that it, it really would only be acceptable to erect a dwelling in this location if it were to comply with self-build and that would be secured by way of condition. So moving on further to the application and the proposal that's before us today, uh, this is the site that we're looking at. Uh, so we've got a cluster of 10 dwellings here along Mill Lane and there's four opposite here. Uh, uh, village of Wed Wedmore here to the northwest. Uh, settlement boundary kind of wraps around these dwellings here and along, along these ones here. So we are certainly in the countryside. With these two parcels of land here are uh, protected by policy D31 countryside around settlement. It doesn't extend to, to this uh, land over here or, or include these dwellings along Mill Lane. It's just to give you some context. And then that view kind of slightly closer up that we were just looking at a moment ago, seeing those uh, properties that exist along Mill Lane here, this cluster, and then the dwellings opposite. And here we have the location plan that's been provided for the application. So again, you can see the 10, 10 dwellings here, the four opposite, and this is the application site outlined in red. The blue outline shows the remainder of the additional land that is owned by the applicant. There is a public right of way that is shown by this kind of red dotted line here that runs between, and you can see that sits outside of the application site. And then behind, that runs then behind the properties on Mill Lane that are existing. And the proposal is for the erection of one dwelling with access just here. So that will require the removal of a small extent of hedgerow. Got an indicative layout plan um, to kind of demonstrate how this could be achieved within the site. So we've got a, d a detached dwelling house here shown um, parking uh, and, 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 uh, and turning there. Um, it is within the officer's report, as my colleague Adrian mentioned there, that concern has been raised with regards to uh, whether this is an acceptable layout. Um, it is indicative only, so we're, that's not a matter for consideration today. What we're looking for is purely whether or not the principle of a dwelling in this location could be achieved and if there's sufficient scope within the site for that to be, to be done and whether the access arrangements that are shown are acceptable. Here we can say in more detail where the extent of hedgerow would be to be removed and the visibility displays that can be achieved. The remainder of the existing hedgerow is to be retained. These are scale plans that have been provided. Again, um, as set out there, they are indicative only and they seek to demonstrate that the intention is that it would be seen as a single storey dwelling from uh, the roadside of Mill Lane. As I say, these are indicative only, but form part of the application. Uh, so in terms of planning policy and the principle of development, the application, as I mentioned, is located in the countryside. Policy CO2 of Sedgeball uh, Local Plan does provide support for infill residential development in the countryside, where a small village or hamlet has a clearly defined nucleus of existing dwellings, and the proposal would amount to the infilling of that. Now, the supporting text, I'm um, just going to the last bullet point on your slide there, um, does make clear that it is intended to apply only where there exists a defined nucleus of a reasonable size, typically at least 10 dwellings. Development must maintain or enhance this pattern of development and it should not physically extend the built form into the countryside. It needs to be demonstrated that the scale and nature of the development is appropriate to the size, accessibility, character and identity of the existing com community and is in accordance with policy D19. OK, so again, just to uh, reflect on that again, we've got the existing built form along Mill Lane. Uh, 10 dwellings on the northern side of the of the road in quite a tightly knit linear pattern. And immediately opposite the application site, we've got further four dwellings. We've got the public footpath that runs between this cluster of developments, uh, cl cluster of dwellings, sorry, and the application site. And that goes in a northwesterly direction towards Mutton Lane. What we would be looking here is a kind of rounding off of this existing cluster. So uh, there is, uh, 
it, what we're looking at is that there is sufficient development on this side and opposite that this proposal here would effectively round off this cluster of built form and it wouldn't be seen as an extension into the countryside there would still be this quite clear um, countryside space between any other built form and the cluster that we're looking at today so some site photos for you these first few images are taken from the public right of way uh, so just taken from around here and this is looking in a northeasterly direction across the application site. You can see the topography of the site is such that it slopes down away from the roadside. And this is looking directly east along that hedgerow that we uh, mentioned a moment ago um, from the public right of way. This is looking north along the public right of way. You've got the neighbouring property here on the other side of this boundary, which will see slightly clearer in a photograph in a moment. And this is further down the public right of way, looking back towards the application site. So you've got that neighbouring uh, dwelling here and then the two dwellings opposite. OK, and this is looking west across the application site, giving you a slightly clearer view of that boundary that exists with the public right of way that runs along here and the pro neighbouring property. And looking in a southeasterly direction gives you a bit of an indication of the topography of the site. And this photo in the bottom of your screen is taken from the gateway for the public right of way, looking back towards the neighbouring property. And these photos here are taken from the roadside. This is the property that's directly opposite the application site to give you a, a feel really for the context of, of where we're looking to put the dwelling. And then this one is uh, again looking at that cluster of four. So this is that front, most front dwelling. And then there's another dwelling behind and some more further to the uh, west of the site. That's the neighbouring bungalow and as you can see there kind of follows the line of built form down there. So you can see the kind of nature of Mill Lane is is a kind of single single carriageway. This is uh, the other uh, dwelling that is opposite the application site. So you've seen see them both and then again just another image looking down Mill Lane. And the arrows on this uh, plan here show where these images are taken from. So this first uh, image to the top of your screen is taken from this proximate location here, looking in the direction of the application site. <clears throat> uh, whilst this image is taken approximately again here, uh, looking back along Mill Lane, see the tree there um, is uh, obviously one and the same. And these images are taken further to the west of Mill Lane and it's just to give you a bit more of a feel as I say for the context of the built form that's there. So this is a dwelling that you can see on the corner and then the second image is just taken slightly further along. And this is the gate that we looked at um, previously where the other images were and it's kind of taken looking in quite a southwesterly direction across the application site with uh, the property opposite or the first of the properties opposite uh, there you can see just in the, the top of the photo and again from a similar position looking to give you a little bit more context of of the the rear of the dwellings along mill lane that just shows you the approximate position of where where the, those images are taken and this slide here um, we've got some images uh, coming up now which just give you um, an, an idea of the visibility of the ridgeline development from the B3139. So this Wedmore is over here and this road leads over to Three Thiel and then over on, onto Wells. So we've got Mill Lane development here and the cluster of four opposite and this is the application site. Okay, so this is the first of those photographs taken just outside the settlement boundary, looking towards um, the, the kind of most westerly element of Mill Lane there. Further along, you can see that the views are um, more, more difficult because of the uh, nature of the boundary, tr the treatment that runs along uh, the B3139. Uh, the views are, are quite, quite limited. And then this taken from this location here, and you can just see there the top of the property opposite the application site that we we're looking at. So this is the application site here. OK, just to give you an indication of the level of views. So highways and parking, um, as I say, a new access is to be created to the eastern side of the application site and to facilitate that a small area of hedgerow is needed to be removed. The rest of the hedgerow is to be retained. Concerns have been raised regarding the adequacy of the parking on site, but the layout of the site and the size of the dwelling is not determined at this stage. 
Um, it really is a matter of whether there's sufficient scope for the site for a single dwelling and parking to be accommodated in principle. Uh, the level of parking that is required will be dependent on the number of bedrooms uh, within any property. So whilst uh, the detail given is indicative, it's not, to, it's, it's not for assessment at this stage. Uh, that will be for any reserve matters application to demonstrate. We're looking really primarily at the access point with the highway that is subject to conditions considered acceptable and to comply with policies. Ecology, uh, the application site does lie within back consultation zone C. The county ecology initialist, uh, excuse me, county ecologist initially confirmed there was no objection subject to recommended conditions to secure a lighting sign for bats and biodiversity enhancement. Concerns were subsequently raised uh, regarding the possible presence of badger sets and an ecology appraisal was commissioned. No evidence of badger sets, mammal paths or foraging was found on the site and the report concluded that the site was composed of improved and well grazed grassland and was generally species poor and of low ecological value. The boundary hedgerow uh, provides a useful green link for the movement of local wildlife, although it is isolated from the wider hedgerow network. Um, as set out previously, it is to be retained, save as for the section to be removed to create the new access. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, um, comments, further comments were raised uh, with regards to ecology um, just prior to the previous committee in December. And following that, further comments were sought from the ecologist who has now suggested an additional condition which is included there in the report. And that will is a pre-commencement condition. In terms of landscape and visual impact, um, as you've seen from the photographs from the site plan, Mill Lane is sited along an elevated ridge um, from uh, Wedmore, and the built form is visible from the B3139 and the public right of way. Um, it is my view that any new dwelling would be seen within the context of the existing built form. And whilst we have indicative landscape detail within the design and access statement, the boundary detail and landscaping would form part of a subsequent reserve matters application. There are concerns regarding the scale and the appearance of the dwelling, but again, these matters are now reserved. Um, indicative detail while shown on the plans and, and provided within the design and access statement is that um, it really is at this stage, whether or not in principle, a dwelling in that location would have an unacceptable landscape and visual impact or whether or not it, it meets with the policy requirements. Um, in my view, it would be seen within the context of the existing built form, as I mentioned, and the the remainder of the detail would be uh, something to be discussed at, at a later stage. Just to give you an idea of the extent of the public rights of ways, I've included this plan here. So here we have the application site and the public right of way where the photographs are taken from and where that runs along there down to, to Mutton Lane. And, and then, uh, as I say, that kind of connects with an additional network of public footpaths. The public footpath does lie outside of the red line of the application site and an informative would be applied. Design and access statement again um, indicates a landscape buffer, uh, particularly to this, this boundary. Um, again, details of boundary treatments and landscaping is reserved, so that would be something that would again need to be discussed and uh, secured during a reserve matters application. So just to summarise, uh, principle of development is considered acceptable under policy CO2, it would be seen as a rounding off of a cluster of built form that is of sufficient scale. Access is the only matter for which detail is provided and that is considered to be acceptable. The layout, scale, landscaping and appearance are all matters that are reserved and the application for outline permission for the erection of one self-built dwelling with the access to the site as shown is subject to my con uh, subject to conditions recommended for permission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, as you'll see, we have a, a number of speakers on this application. So if we could start with uh, Cheryl Morris, if you could turn on your microphone and just confirm that it's working for us, please. Cheryl Morris, could do you turn on your mic and, and just give us a, a sound check? Ms. Nicholson, if I could just check, is, is Cheryl Morris with us? She is chairman um and it's shown that her microphone is is unmuted okay 
certainly I, I don't know whether you're hearing I'm not hearing anything no I'll give one last try if, if Cheryl Morris if you can address this can you just see if you can be heard do we have Mrs Morris's um, statement submitted to us that we could read out yeah do you um do you want to give us an opportunity to log out and log back in again to see if that gets it working? Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take a. If it, hopefully, she can hear us talking. Um, I'm gonna remove her from the meeting. Mrs. Morris, if you can, if you can uh, retry, that would be great. Okay, members. We'll we'll just if we take a, a sh very short comfort break for a couple of minutes just to. Uh, to see if we can get Mrs. Morris back into the meeting and, uh, and able to address us. So we'll we'll restart at uh, 10 past 10. OK, Mrs. Morris, can you hear us and, and can um, you just check? For... Yes, ah. can you hear me? We can indeed. I'm Excellent. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Don't worry about it at all. Uh, as I say, you, you'll you'll have the three minutes to address the committee. Um, so start when you're ready and you'll hear the bell go when there's one minute left to go. So start whenever you're ready. Thank you. I represent the views of all residents in the cluster of Mill Lane, plus some from the wider community. This site is an open space reduced to the Mendips, an AONB and beyond. The proposed dwelling would border two footpaths, the most downloaded on the village website, which have regular footfall of walkers and those coming to admire the Mendips, or just seeking an open space and the sense of well-being this affords. Wheelchair users and those not well enough to walk the footpaths can currently enjoy the open space and far reaching views from the viewpoint at the gate in Mill Lane. If this dwelling goes ahead, it will be right in the line of vision. The remaining path and view would be seen between two properties, impacting on the setting forever, especially for the less able. This proposal therefore does nothing to protect or enhance significant views. Visitors also say the openness they come for would be gone and would find open space elsewhere. They use our shops and cafes, so we need to encourage visitors and not put them off. As there are no parks, Wedmore values open spaces like this. They're regarded as an asset for everyone and help enjoy and guide by Wedmore as an ideal place to walk and visit. A dwelling so close to affecting the enjoyment of these popular paths will negate what the Village Footpath Project seeks to achieve. It may look like infill on paper, but visually it's not, being the sole dwelling in the top right hand corner of a highly visible field. It would look unrelated to existing properties which are unobtrusively concealed and neatly rounded off in a separate field. None are of this magnitude nor have detached outbuildings. It would create unsympathetic visual dominance all round, particularly from the Mendips and the North. When the previous application was declined, one of you said it would have been right on the ridge line and very visible for miles around. This is the same, only 100 yards from the previous site and even more incongruous, contextually inappropriate, yet high enough, unlike existing, to overlook others. D31 did not apply to this field as it was always deemed outside the countryside and outside of any development boundary. It's hard to visualise any construction here would blend in with the surroundings, let alone one as avant-garde as this. The street view is an unbroken hedge dating from 1790, lining a narrow byway where vehicles find it difficult to turn. The access would create a significant interruption to it and a hazard in an area commonly considered safe to let dogs and children run freely. The applicants live 100 yards away from where they engage in local activities perfectly well and already have these views and spaces unlike the community who comes specifically for this. Where's the demand to build here over the need highlighted by COVID for open spaces safely accessible for all? Lacking in support for the community with impacts on landscape, road safety, economy and loss of amenity, it would not be in the public interest for any development here. Thank you. Thank you very much and, and very well timed. If we move on to our second speaker, and that's uh, Sue Worrell. Again, could you enable your microphone and just check that it's working for us, please? Good morning. Excellent, that is working. So again, just a reminder, you'll, you've got three minutes and, and you should hear the bell go when there's one minute of that left to go. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This project has given the Parish Council somewhat of a dilemma. Let me explain. 
The original application at the beginning of 2020 was located adjacent to the applicant, applicant's existing home on Mill Lane to the east of, of this application. This application only generated one objection from local residents and had the support of our parish council and our district councillor. However, planning was refused by SPC on the grounds that it was outside a defined, defined settlement boundary and was located in the, in the countryside. And it wasn't in a nucleus of buildings. In fact, there are four substantial buildings in this cluster already. The reason we're referring to this precedent application because it is in the same field and has the same impact. This new has a different impact, sorry. This new application and reciting of the house has caused considerable upset with over 20 objections from local residents, have you, as you've heard from the officer. The parish council took these local objections into consideration when deciding to object to this recited application. We feel that this will be detrimental to the beauty of Mill Lane and its effect on open vistas. To the west of the new proposed home, there, will, there is a very well used public right of way, which finishes at gateway leading into the lane. At this gateway is a stunning panoramic view over to the Mendips. This vista will be lost completely by the reciting of this application. We are in an era of encouraging walking in our countryside for our physical and mental health. Preserving wonderful walks and vistas must be beneficial to this aim. We wonder where the common sense lies when a proposed building which is acceptable to the local community cannot be built at one end of a field, but is acceptable at the other end of the field where it has detriment effects on local important vistas and has no local support from the residents of Mill Lane. And it is with this in mind, we ask you to refuse this application. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we then come to our, our third speaker, and that's uh, Lee Wright. Again, if you could uh, enable your microphone and just confirm that it's working for us, please. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. So again, to remind you, you've got the three minutes and you'll hear the bell go when there's one minute to go. So please start when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, councillors. I'm Lee Wright, planning agent for the application. As members will be aware, this self-build proposal originally came before the committee in May 2020 when the dwelling was sited at the other end of the same field. The application was then recommended for refusal by officers, with the linchpin being the location adjacent to the applicant's current home. The location preferred by officers was alongside the existing bulk of development in Mill Lane. Notably, the applicants have worked closely with officers, taking on board their advice, so that the revised application before you today is recommended for approval by officers, and this is supported by no objection from any of the statutory consultees. The location now proposed presents a natural extension to the built form of Mill Lane to the west and rounds off development with the existing built form to the south, making this a logical location for new development and presenting the least impact as well as meeting with self-built policy. Whilst the last application had objection from only one neighbour and the support of parish council, this application to the contrary, the current application, has a number of neighbour objections and an objection from the parish council. This complete about turn by the community is not surprising, as neighbour preference was for the new dwelling to be sited at the other end of the field, as it was in that previous application, and not as it is now, adjacent to those neighbours' homes. Much objection relates to issues of design and detail of the proposed dwelling, However, this application is an outline planning application. The only matters for consideration today are principle and access. The applicants not only wish to remind councillors that they are long-time residents who will remain as residents and part of this community if this application is approved, but also wish to provide councillors their absolute assurances that any reserve matters design will be of the highest quality, the highest energy efficiency, and be designed to very much limit impact on neighbours and the landscape. After all, the applicants have endeavoured at all junctures 
to try and assimilate the aims and aspirations of the community with those of councillors and officers. We therefore respectfully ask you as decision makers to support the application before you today that accords with planning policy, rounds off development in this location and has the support of the ward councillor and officers. To close, we thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just before I come back to, to members, I believe, Ms Nicholson, we've heard back from Councillor Granter. Yes, Chairman, um, we've uh, he was having technical problems and he's still having technical problems, so he's given his apologies now. OK, thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? I'm seeing a hand up, but I can't see whose hand it is at the moment. Councillor Kingham. Uh, again, if I could ask members if you could try and use the chat if it's if it's working for you, because obviously it's easier to keep track of you in the chat than it is with the hands up. So, um, uh, but we'll start with with Councillor Kingham, please. Yes, that, sorry, Chairman. I was trying to do both at the same time, and uh, I wasn't getting anywhere. Anyway, um, yes, thank you. Um, this application, obviously, a lot of people have have taken the trouble to um, write comments on how they feel about this application. I think a lot of them are very personal regarding views, um, the type of build, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Some of them are obviously are, are relevant to a plan application decision, but some aren't. They're, and also, I'm, so I travel from Cheddar towards Wedmore and now that we, I'm traveling home in a lighter evenings, you can actually see the ridge line. You do tend to notice the, the line of bungalows which are already present. And I try to visualize this new development on the end. And actually, when you come from Cheddar, you can't actually see it because there is a, a tree which blocks the view. And I think with this building actually being set down lower than the road, obviously it will alleviate some of the views. Um, and also, this this is a narrow lane. I know I know that lane well. Um, and obviously turning is very difficult, so it is important that if permission is granted, they do have sufficient turning for a number of vehicles. But I notice on the plan at the moment they don't show a garage, so they obviously would part on the drive. Um, and at the moment, I don't particularly have a problem with this application, but um, I will see what other members will will say. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got a number of other councillors who've indicated now. I've got Councillor Scott, Kendry and Gibson. So we'll start with Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I remember this when it came to committee beforehand. Um, obviously, the people have got the self-build um, qualification. And also, it's said that the reserve matters will actually include the size and scale of the development which will be in keeping. So I haven't actually got a problem with that. Um, I was a bit unclear about the route of the footpath. I couldn't actually follow the drawing. Um, so if the officer could actually indicate where the footpath will be, that would be helpful. OK, Mrs Chorley, if you could do that for us and then we'll come back to Councillor Scott. Good morning. Yeah, so here is a plan showing the public rights of way um, that's a, a layer from our mapping system. So this is the public right of way that is accessed from Mill Lane. The footpath runs down that field and then there's the small gate and then it runs back along these properties and northwestly to Mutton Lane where there's another footpath great gate and you can walk back along that the bottom of that field there. And this is quite quite steep. Uh, the topography of the field, you can run, walk back along there and then down um, to join uh, that B3139 that we, we've talked about, the, which is the, the road that ultimately goes out to, to Wells and, and such like. Uh, Mr. Troy, if you helps. just indicate again just where the, the proposed dwelling is on that particular plan. Yeah, so the proposed dwelling would be just here. So the red line of the application site kind of mirrors the boundary of this property opposite. Um, and runs along and down. I'll just um, very quickly show you the uh, layout plan again so you can see the both. 
all side by side. So there we go, that's the, the public right of way footpath that we just looked at in detail, going down there and running back along mill, the, the existing dwellings on Mill Lane, and that's the application site there. Thank you, Councillor Scott. Yes, it appears that the gate that we see in the photograph near the concrete block is slightly along the lane from the neighbouring bungalow, but on the public right of way looks as though it comes out by the the neighbouring bungalow, um, but I'm not sure what kind of access that would be, Whether because um, the lady from the parish council said that um, people like to stand there and look at the view through a gate, and I assume that to be the gate into the field rather than the footpath. Yes, so there's a field gate here at present um, that you you would need to open to be able to walk through the, the, the public footpath, which I've done. Um, and then you will um, recall from the photographs, possibly I can show them again, there was the uh, small, uh, so that's the field gate there, yeah. onto the edge of it that you see from Mill Lane. And yeah. then slightly further down, there are some photos taken from the um, other gate where, which is kind of approximately here. Um, and and it, the looking back up towards the site. So this is the field gate, or just glimpsing the edge of the field gate there, where oh, you can okay. view from Mill Lane. And the red line of the application site, as I say, is to to run there. So it effectively, the the public right of way sits outside of the application site. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hendry. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, councillors. I, I have heard and taken on board what everybody said uh, about this in the village. The reserve matters being indicative of the application being passed today are fully understood and actually acceptable. With a view from above, then the new self-built house actually fills in perfectly to form the infill on the corner on that on that particular site. The access is OK. The statutory consultees all seem to be okay with this. There's no problem with any of that. Uh, so for this moment, I don't have anything negative to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other Councillor Gibson, then Councillor Pearce. So Councillor Gibson. Hello. Yeah. Um. I was going to ask the questions that Councillor Scott was um put forward really, but I don't think just filling in like in a straight line. I I don't think it's that simple. It's not just like, well, that ends up and that's a nice corner there. I think you've got to take into consideration the views and the topography of the land and the lay of the land. And I think if the building was right up against the road and you still had that view behind the access to the view from the gate, it, it lines up right. It seems to line right up onto the pathway. So I've got a problem with that. Um, I did have another question, but it was mainly around around that really the view and uh, the fact that you just because it's you think it's land it is filling it in um it doesn't mean it needs to be straight you've got to look, there's more more to it than that i think thank you mrs chorley do you want to come back on any comment on that uh yeah the topography of the land um of we've got from the photographs you can see that it is it is a sloping site certainly um and the the, the detail that comes forward as part of as part of the reserve mass application the layout um and the height of the building will certainly need to take account from that you can see um that it does kind of level out slightly towards the top there but certainly the, the field does does slope away um if, if i think that's probably the only comment i've got at this stage it's just a point of view. I mean, it, it is a point. It's a good point of view for people um, using that that access there. I think the house would block any, anything built there, really, unless it was right up on the road would block that view. And I just think that just because it's in a straight line, it doesn't mean it's got to be filled in. You've got to look at more. There's more to it than that. It's, it's not that simple. Thank you. I think Mr. Noon, did you want to comment? Mr. Noon? Again, Mr. Noon, I'm not sure whether you are on mute, but we're not hearing you at the moment. Uh, 
we'll come back to Mr. Noon if we can. Uh, right, I've just had a message that microphone issues. So we'll we'll carry on with Councillor Pierce, and we'll see if uh, if Mr. Noon can join us in a moment. Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. I think my question's actually been answered too, because mine was about the right of way and the gate, and also with slide 13 up at the moment. And my other question was going to be about the impact on the near neighbour and just trying to determine whether it would um, sort of block any views. And um, from slide 13, it doesn't look that way, but I'd be grateful for a little bit more clarification, please. OK, Mrs Chorley. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, so is it views from this neighbouring dwelling here that you're concerned about? Yes. Uh, so the views obviously uh, looking at north towards the Mendips would, uh, is, is in that direction there. So they, they would be unaffected by any development here. Obviously, you can see the boundary treatment there that, that would divide the properties and then the public right of way. Uh, there would obviously need to be some additional boundary treatment again. Um, the, the Undoubtedly from this window here, um, and possibly this one here, you would have views of the of the dwelling house, uh, but it would be, as you can see, set back from this boundary and then uh, the public right of way and another boundary. If we go back to the uh, location plan, you can see the proposed, um, as I say, albeit on indicative layout, um, shows the distance between the dwellings is it, uh, it, far greater than what exists between terms of the others. Um, it's not considered that would necessarily result in an unacceptable impact. Uh, there is scope uh, within the site for a dwelling to be sited there without having an adverse kind of overlooking um, and mutual overlooking or loss of privacy between these two dwellings, particularly given the um, existing boundary treatment and as I say any views that they currently have uh, towards Wedmore and the hills beyond would be effect, uh, would be unaffected. Um, from these properties, uh, views from private properties currently obviously look out towards a current open field and there would be a dwelling uh, there, a single storey dwelling. Um, again, quite a considerable distance as shown between them. It's not considered there would be a result of um, undue uh, impact in terms of overlooking or loss of privacy between them, um, provided it was uh, single storey uh, as at front more lane certainly uh, which again would be secured through any reserve matters um, but there would undoubtedly be a uh, this dwelling would have an impact on the views from these properties from the private properties thank you any other comments or questions from members and i'll while members are indicating i'll just come back as mr noon Yes, I, I am You're with us. Uh, apologies. I've, this is a formatting issue. Every time I go to the um, comments section, uh, half the screen disappears and I have to log out of the meeting to get back to my microphone control. So apologies. I'm off the chat line, I think, for now. I just wanted to point out if, if Emma could show the picture taken from just down in the field from the entrance through on the footpath looking back up. That's the one there. Um, Obviously, yeah, the consideration here is is how development would relate to the existing for, built form. Um, obviously, in plan form, we're looking at we would be looking at something that follows the line of the the bungalows along Mill Lane back towards the west. But also, we have the the gable end of that roadside building on the opposite side, which forms a sort of punctuation to development going the other way to the east. Um, so I think we've got sort of, sort of two parameters here to look at in terms of where a dwelling could sit in, being in line with the development back along Mill Lane and extending no further than what is quite a strong sort of punctuation mark on the other side of the road. That's quite a large building there. I think we saw it in the photograph taken from below on the main road. So it is a visual sort of um, reference point in longer views. And then obviously, we would change the immediate character of that first 25, 20 or so metres of footpath that would thread between the new house and the existing bungalow. And obviously, yes, the viewpoint that can be seen from the road would change, but in effect, it would just move back a bit further. So you would still have that viewpoint. It would just become apparent a little way down that footpath. And that's not an uncommon occurrence in rural areas where footpaths are or sort of do run between properties and then you come out into the fields behind and obviously users of the footpath are used to the 10 or so properties in the line as they walk 
towards the northwest and can see those. And for the users of the footpath, would their enjoyment be that much diminished by one extra house here in terms of you know, the attractiveness of this 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 area as somewhere to go for a walk in the countryside? Um, I think that's I, 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 I do. I don't clearly we don't think that that would be so detrimental to the enjoyment of the users of that footpath that planning permission could reasonably be, be withheld. It would just in this very small section of that footpath, it would change from a walk along the edge of the field to a walk between two residential properties, which is experienced commonly. Uh, and I think down at the bottom end on the B30, uh, off the B, the B road, the Wells Road, um, that's how the footpath comes out down there between other properties. Um, so I think that that issue, yes, it is, it's a, it is a change to the nature of the footpath, but in a very small section, and the view would still appear as you walk to the back of the properties. So just wanted to sort of clarify our thinking there. Thank you. Thank you. If if I could ask a question of, of Mrs. Chorley, in terms of uh, condition four, the lighting condition, um, on a number of other sites, we've we've had these conditions that relate to obviously bats and, and ecology, but we have amended the wording so we take into account the sort of impact on on residents and, and dark skies um, as a sort of standard wording. Is that something that we could update on on this particular condition? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's included within the reasoning there, but we can certainly make that um, clearer within the uh, condition wording itself. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, I've now got councillors Kingham and then Hendry. So Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, just one question for either Mr Noon or Mrs Chorley. Um, a lot of the questions or comments seem to be regarding view. Can we justify the loss of a view over a planning application? Is it something that um, can go against it or for it? Because um, this particular property will be set down lower than the road. Uh, therefore, you should be able to see over the top. And can people claim it, the loss of view as a reason to object? Thank okay. you. Who wants to take that, Mr Noon or Mrs Chorley? I, I'm happy to pick up on that one. Okay, Mr um, Noon. Uh, loss of a view is, is is a very subjective term. It's not normally um, a a sort of articulated as that in um, in coming in, in identifying the harms of a permission. Where what we're looking here is a, it would be a, the detriment to visual the visual amenity or or as I said previously the enjoyment of the users of the footpath. Um, from that point of view, I suppose there's two issues: is would a house here um, just be so visually incongruous as to be objectionable in principle. Um, I don't think so. Um, it would it would change this corner of the field, but I don't think to the extent that we could reasonably withhold permission. And then the other aspect of view would be the design and the appearance of the house when that comes forward at reserve matters. And I think our position on that is there's no reason, you know, if we've accepted the principle at this stage, we could look at, you know, very critically and carefully the design of the house. So, yes, view is a component, but we articulate it slightly differently in terms of design and the visual amenities of the locality. So, yes, it would change, but would it change so detrimentally that we should withhold permission? I think that is the question. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hendry. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, had to unmute myself. Could we go back to slide three, please? Slide number three. All right, OK. If you look at that, uh, Councillor Stuart Kingham pointed out, and quite rightly so, that the, the height of the ridge line is actually low enough to be acceptable. The, the geography of the whole layout there is, uh, as I've already said, uh, it actually fits in to fill in that corner. Plots of land rarely stay empty like this in perpetuity. It, it doesn't really happen because of the, the whole layout. Uh, as I've said already, I don't have a problem with this at all as it stands, and I would like to move the recommendation, Mr Chairman. Thank you. OK, and just to confirm, that's with the additional condition that was referred to at the beginning of the report and also the amended lighting condition? Absolutely, first class. Thank you. OK. Thank you. I've got Councillor Scott. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, could um, the officer please confirm that um, 
the um, reserve matters will actually be available for scrutiny by the parish council and residents. Mrs Chorley. Yes, I can. Um, in the event outline permission is granted, a subsequent application would need to be made for reserve matters uh, that would go through the usual standard consultation period uh, with members of the public, statutory consultees, including the parish council and ward member, and everybody would have the right to comment on that in the same way. Um, and that would include such matters such as scale design, um, a landscape detail um, and how it see, uh, appears within the, the street scene. Thank you. And Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Yeah, I'd like to um, second the recommendation behind Alice, Councillor Henry. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other comments or questions from members, so we will move to a, a vote uh, with members. Um, so if we start with Councillor Glassford, and again, if I can just remind members, if you can confirm that you've been present throughout the presentation. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I have been present throughout the whole uh, presentation. I, I'm for the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've been present for the whole debate and I'm for the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Uh, yeah, I've been present throughout and I'm against. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've been present throughout the whole presentation and um, I'm for the officer's recommendation. Thank you. And Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard everything throughout from the beginning and I am very much for it. Thank you. And Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've been present throughout, Chairman, and I am supporting the officer's recommendation. Councillor Murphy. Yes, Chairman. I have been present and have seen the whole of the presentation and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've been present throughout the whole presentation and I am for. And Councillor Bradford. Present for the whole debate, Mr Chairman, I am for. Councillor Bolt. I've been present throughout the whole debate and I'm for. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I've been present through the whole debate and I am for. And Councillor Grimes. Yes, Chairman, seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Thank you. And I've also seen and heard the whole debate and I'm also for the proposal. So, Mrs Nicholson, if you could just confirm that's all members who are present have voted. Thank you, Chairman. That's 12 in support of the proposal and one against. That's fine. And just to confirm, Mr. Lehman, are you happy that that's the 12 and 12 and 1? Uh, yes, Chairman, I can confirm that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that is clearly carried. So permission is, is granted. Thank you. Members, if you move then to our next application that we have, which is on page 15. And we're within the parish of Bordrip stall. And again, Mrs Chorley, if you could introduce this one, please. Thank you, Chairman. Here we have a retrospective application for the erection of a garage and workshop at Mill Barn Ford Lane Store. Uh, just to give you a wider context of where we are, so it's to the north of Stall and to the south of the A39. Uh, the application site lies here and got an isolated position in the countryside. And this slightly closer aerial image, so we have the host dwelling here, a range of outbuildings that are existing. And this here shows the footprint, oh, sorry, uh, the footprint of uh, the building uh, that we are now looking at uh, uh, permission for. So these are the plans that we have. The location plan showing the application site as a whole, edged in red, and it's this building here that permission is sought for. Uh, slightly um, confusing, the, but this again is the building that's sought for. This is that host dwelling here and the longer of the buildings that kind of sits there. So these are the plans that are for consideration today. So we can see that there are the two double garages uh, store space here. Um, access to a room above, uh, which is described as storage, um, is via a raised platform. Uh, there are two dormers pro, uh, 
to the building and to roof lights and there is an additional raised platform on the northeast elevation. Uh, as I say, the application is retrospective, so we do have some site photos that have been provided by the agent of the building in situ. Here we can see the host dwelling and here is the building. Um, you may note that the staircase here is larger than that that's shown on the plans. Uh, that's due to during the life of the application, a request was made for that to be reduced in its size to ensure that it, it sat more comfortably against the building. And you'll see that in slightly more detail in the next images. OK, so you can see the bulk of mass of it there. It measures two and a half metres at the moment, and that is to be reduced by one metre. So it will be pulled in so it doesn't project above the roof plane, quite importantly. Um, it will still be of the same materials. Uh, you can see that we've got the render elevation, uh, which matches elements of the host dwelling and the tiles to match existing. The bottom photo just shows the kind of front. If you were coming through the application site, that, that's the element that you would see as you approached. Uh, the principle of development has been considered and permission was granted previously for erection of a garage with a games room storeroom above in the same location. A uh, very similar uh, scale and design. You'll note this one has six dormers rather than the two dormers and two roof lights and a slight amendment to how the ground floor is, is laid out rather than the two kind of large double garages. We've got the three single sets of doors here. Uh, the staircase has also been amended. You'll see that it was originally quite, uh, a much smaller design and there was no, um, no proposal on the other side. Uh, so again, that's just setting out in detail. Uh, what has changed? Uh, the materials used have changed from timber cladding with timber frame windows to a render finish to the elevation with aluminium frame windows. The internal layout has changed uh, to show now two garage bays and a storeroom. Uh, the design of the external staircase has altered and there's a reduction in the number of dormers from six to two and the inclusion of roof lights. Um, as I explained, the external staircase and balcony as built that measures 2.5 metres wide and that has been uh, requested to be reduced by one metre so it sits more comfortably within uh, against the building. Uh, that's what's shown on the revised plans and it is suggested that a condition is used to secure these works being completed within six months. Uh, the application is before members because the Parish Council have objected uh, to this application on the basis of the change of materials, uh, the use of render rather than timber cladding, uh, particularly being out of keeping with the rural countryside location of the building. Uh, whilst that is noted, um, in my view, the material change isn't inappropriate when it's viewed within the context of the existing built form. Uh, there are elements um, of render that feature uh, within the existing built form there on the application site. Um, in my view, subject to the reduction in the size of the external staircase being secured, it's not considered that this development results in an unacceptable visual impact. Uh, there's no adverse impact on residential amenity. As you can see, the site is quite far removed from any other uh, any other uh, neighbouring property. There are public right of way um, just uh, to the west of the site. Uh, there is no objection. An informative was recommended stating no obstruction to the right of way whilst the works are carried out. But as permission is sought retrospectively, the works have already been carried out and the informative wouldn't be applicable. Ecology, uh, the ecologist has re recommended a number of conditions. Um, Unfortunately, because the application is retrospective, it's not possible to utilise a pre-commencement condition uh, regarding the protection of the existing landscaping. Again, the work's already been carried out and the conditions that would require measures to be built into the structure, again, cannot be secured. Um, her concerns have been raised regarding external lighting. Uh, such a condition wasn't imposed on the previous application and or on other, any other of the consents affecting the application site. Um, so it's not considered that can be considered strictly necessary for the development to be permitted. Biodiversity enhancements can be secured. Uh, they can be secured retrospectively and um, previous consent certainly included a condition requiring um, a, a bat box to, to be erected and it's considered appropriate to include that and request that that be done within three months of the date of any permission. Um, additionally, uh, the restriction on the use, the previous application did restrict the use um, to ensure that it was used purely for ancillary purposes and wasn't to be used less or otherwise disposed of as any separate unit of accommodation. It's quite a large ancillary uh, building. It's considered that the same condition should be applied to this consent if granted because we are in the countryside and it's not considered that this is a suitable location for a further dwelling. 
So just to summarise, um, the principle of development is considered acceptable subject to conditions, restricting the use uh, to ancillary only, um, ensuring that biodiversity enhancements are still secured and ensuring that the amendments to the external staircase, again, are also secured um, and to be completed within six months. And subject to the same is my recommendation that permission be granted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't have any speakers on this particular application, so I'll come straight to members and Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a question for Mrs. Chorley. Um, I noticed the comments are from board rep. So is this one which is sort of a, a cross-border application? If so, and we didn't get, we haven't had any comments from Store Parish Council itself. Is there a particular reason why? Why not? Mrs. Chorley. Bear with me one moment. So the application in um, as it falls within the parish of Baldrip, uh, so that's why uh, they've been consulted and the comments have have been received from them. Councillor Kingham, did you want to comment? Yeah, it's just obviously it comes under store. We've got um, a, the boundaries of Baldrip. Um, I was just wondering, you know, wh whether store should have actually have commented. That was all. I think the only thing some sometimes and I know certainly within within my own patch there are there are areas that fall within the parish of Brent Null, but with actually within the postal address of Limpsham or, or East Brent. So sometimes the uh, the old civil parishes don't always necessarily match up exactly with the postal addresses. Um Councillor Perry, did you want to comment? Yes, thank you. Yeah, um the parish of Baldrop is in my ward, but I didn't actually uh, um, was present through any of the parish council's discussions on this particular issue. So I was a bit confused as to where it was, whether it was in stall or in Baldrick itself. I was under the impression it was under stall, in stall. Uh, sorry about that. So, okay, but just, just to confirm, you're, you're making a non predetermination declaration anyway. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. That's I, all right. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. No problem at all. Sorry, yes, Chairman. Obviously, it'd be the same for me. I thought it was um, under store, but uh, I'm not a member of Baldrip. Fine. So, so just to be <laughs> sure, both both councillors who cover Baldrip and Stall have declared <laughs> have declared interest to make sure they they took no part in any discussions at any parish council meetings that were considering <laughs> this particular <laughs> application. And I see that Mrs. Lehman has noted that. So, thank you very much. Any other comments or questions from members? Yep, uh, Councillor Perry, your hand is still up. Is that because you want to come back? No, sorry, sorry, my fault, sorry. That's all right, no worries. Uh, Councillor Grimes. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't see an issue with, um, with this application, actually. I think with the conditions that's on there, and being as it, it's just a material consideration of what materials is used on it, I'm going to move the recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councillor Tony Grimes, I agree with everything you said there. It complies with policy D2 of the local plan. Uh, outside of that, it's so far from anybody else. It doesn't spoil views or nothing like that at all. It's absolutely fine. And I'd like to second Councillor Tony Grimes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. I think Councillor Grimes, your hand is is up. Did you want to come back or was that just a, a it's gone? OK. Councillor Bradford's indicating, Chairman. OK, sorry, I wasn't seeing that one. So Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just going to say that, uh, you know, if everybody did this, to be OK, wouldn't it? Retrospective, retrospective, retrospective. I suppose we all did that. I had something like this built and I had to go for all the planning consent and all the other issues regarding it all. You know, it, a lot of these things, investigations, what have you, retrospective. 
you know, police are out, Avon Somerset police are out yesterday all over some all over the area picking up people who broke the COVID rules. Eight hundred pound fine, just like that. You know, it's making a mockery of us as a planning committee that we gotta come and comment on things that already been done. Everybody's saying, Oh, that's all right, okay, fair enough. Because we all break the law. It's got to be a stand on this at some stage. That's a big old garage, and, and we can all see what's going to happen eventually. That'll be that'll be a living accommodation eventually. It's quite quite plain to see. That's all I'm going to say, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I think the only comment I can can make, Councillor Bradford, would, would agree that retrospective applications certainly are not something that we we look to encourage. I would just obviously, as this application in front of us has shown, this this isn't something that didn't have any permission. They had a permission, but they didn't build it exactly as they should have done. So obviously the balance that we have to look at is whether the changes are so significant that we feel that that permission should not be granted. So it's it's not that they built it with no permission, it's just that they built it not in accordance with the original application. And certainly uh, it is something that we don't encourage, but I don't know whether uh, Mrs Chorley, did you want to make any further comment on that? It's built with it. Mrs Chorley? Uh Thank you, Chairman. Yes, um, uh, that's absolutely right. Um, the, the principle of the development here has already been uh, determined, an application was received, um, and that, that also extended to the kind of the footprint and the scale and the height of the building. The changes are design changes um, as set out. It's the reduction in dormers, inclusion of roof lights, the external staircase rearrangement, and the ground floor layout has altered from the three single garage doors to the two double garages. Um, the material palette has changed from timber cladding to uh, a render to the elevation, but but that is the, the, the limitations of the, the differences between what was granted permission and what we actually have before us today. And again, Mrs. Chorley, if you could just confirm in terms of the potential future uses, you have continued to roll forward the, the condition stopping stopping it becoming domestic residence. Yeah, absolutely. The exact uh, the condition is to be uh, a, a, the condition restricting the use is to be carried forward on this this permission in the same way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Councillor Bradford. Uh, I think Councillor Scott, you indicated, and and then I'll come to I think Mr. Noon may have his hand up. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you. That just clarified one of the points I was going to raise. Um, Emma Chorley did. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if there'd be a time limit on these um, changes. Thank you. Mrs Chorley. Uh, yes, the, so the condition that requires the reduction in the scale of the external staircase is time limited by six months from the date of permission and the inclusion of the biodiversity enhancements, which previously were to be preoccupation, are now to be delivered within three months. Um, there's slight differentiation between the three months and the six months just uh, to take account of the level and significance of the works, but they're both considered to be reasonable timeframes. Thank you very much for that. And Mr Noon? Uh, yes, if I could just clarify the restriction on use. Um, I mean, obviously, we're, we're, we are we would certainly have control anyway, regardless of, of, of a condition such as this, um, over any change of use to a dwelling. Clearly, that's a subdivision of a planning unit. So we would always capture that. Um, if members' concern is that, um, you know, the, 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 this building might be used as additional habitable com uh, accommodation um, conversion to an annex for example um, we would we, we could re amend the condition slightly just to specifically prevent that um, I don't think we'd have a problem with it as an annex but if members were anxious to for us to exercise that control we could change that condition just to say that it should be only be used for garage and storing and not converted to additional habitable accommodation if that was your concern. Otherwise, the condition as it is just really sort of underlines the fact that it's only to be used as part of the the main house. The other point I just wanted to come back on, um, Emma, if you could just go to the aerial photograph just where we are relative to the parish boundaries, we are in the sort of the north, I guess it must be the northeast corner of of Bordrip. If the other side of the A39 is Chilton Polden and the other side east of Ford Lane, which you can see there running up the side between the orchard and the, the 
the ploughed field to the right, that's the boundary with stall. So I think we took the view here. We're not. It, it, it's a very it's a minor application, effectively a householder application. It doesn't straddle the board, the border, or be, you know, so on top of it that we would automatically consult the neighbouring parishes. I think it's sort of two green, two two fields in from one side and a whole field in on the other side. So I think as with the original application, we didn't consult the adjoining parishes um, just to explain where we are because we didn't feel it was of such significance that it needed that consultation. Um, but really just just also if, if you want us to tighten up that occupancy condition, we can do so. OK, I'll, I'll come back to members on that in a minute, but Mrs Chorley, as far as I understand from the presentation, that hasn't been a major issue that's been raised as a concern. Uh, it's uh, not uh, an issue that's been raised as a concern, no. The okay. only um, issue we have is from the Parish Council regarding yep. the um, design and material finish. OK, I've got Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> I think I was happy with the uh, the conditions as it was, but I would be more happy with um, the condition that Mr. Noon has come up with, uh, just to belt and braces on that. Um, and that was my reason for moving the recommendation because of um, the conditions that were on it anyway. But I'd be more than happy to, to incorporate uh, Mr. Noon's um, condition anyway. Thank you, Chairman. And Councillor Hendry is the seconder. Are you of the same view? Absolutely, I agree with everything that uh, Councillor Grimes has just said. One hundred percent. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Noon, I think have you got your hand back up again? Uh, no, just to say that um, we would, we, yeah, we we would just amend that condition to be obviously the detail of it, the wording to be agreed with yourself and Vice Chairman, just to, to say yeah. that the the store garage shall not be converted to additional habitable accommodation and shall only be used ancillary purposes to the main house. OK. So I'm not seeing any further comments from members. Yes, I am. Councillor Gibson. Yeah, I wouldn't be for that, that extra um, on the end there about the I would go for the original. I would be against that. That extra to say that it wouldn't be used for accommodation um, at all. I think that. Um, I... OK. In which case, the the recommendation that's that's been updated now is 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 the amended condition that that uh, was outlined by Mr. Noon uh, relating to the use of of the building, uh, proposed and seconded by Councillor Hend uh, by Councillors Grimes and Hendry. So, if we move on then to the actual vote, and I'll come to members in turn. We'll start this time with with Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've seen and heard the whole application and I'm for. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. I've seen and heard the full um, details and I'm for. Thank you, Councillor Bolt. Present throughout the whole debate and I'm for. Thank you, Councillor Bradford. The tightening up of some of the things I am for, Mr Chairman. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Kingham. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole presentation. I don't like this application, but on this occasion, I, I will go for the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I have seen and heard the whole application. Like others, I am I'm concerned about the similarity of the, the, the garage to the dwelling side of it. But I like I think the um, I think the recommendation for the conditions says it all. I am for. Thank you. Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I'm present throughout, Chairman, and I'm supporting the officer's recommendation, Chairman. And just to confirm that's with the amended condition, yes? With the conditions, Chairman. OK. Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Seen and heard everything and with the conditions, I'm for. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate and with the amended conditions, I'm for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gibson. Hello. Um, yeah, I've seen and heard the whole debate, um, but I'm unclear about the amendment that you've got on there. What what, what have you put on? Is it with the Adrian uh, Mr. Noon's? Um, yeah, I'm against them. OK. Uh, Councillor Pierce. Yeah, thank you. I've seen and heard the whole debate and with the additional conditions, I am for. 
Thank you, Councillor Glassford. Uh, she didn't have the whole debate, and with the additional conditions, I am for. Thank you, and I've also seen and heard the whole debate, and I'm also for the proposal. So just to confirm, Mr Nicholson, that's all members who are present have voted. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, that's uh, 12 in support and one against. OK, and Mrs Lehman, if you could just confirm that. <laughs> Sorry, Chairman. Um, yes, I can confirm 12 for, one against and the amended condition. That's fine. Thank you very much. So that then, that, as I say, is clearly carried. So permission granted. Uh, that moves us on to the next application, which is in Cheddar. And Amelia Elvey, I think you're presenting this one. Hello. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I'm just um, presenting my screen. Let me know when you can see. Yep, we can see yep. that now. OK. OK, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm here with an application for the erection of a detached garage at Roundstone Barrys Road in Cheddar. So um, a list here of the relevant policies um, that need to be considered. Cheddar benefits also from a neighbourhood plan, so this also needs to be considered when um, making the decision. So the application site here, circled in yellow, lies within the established residential area of Cheddar to the west of the main village centre. Roundstone is a detached property sited to the northwest of an unclassified road. The dwelling is finished with natural stone and masonry stone coins. The dual pitch roof is covered with brown double Roman roof tiles. The front garden area of the property is delineated by a natural stone wall. The application before you is for the erection of a detached double garage within the front curtilage area. As part of the development, some of the stone wall and hedge will be removed to create additional off-road parking and turning and a wider vehicular access. Just so you are aware that the um, aerial view here is actually out of date and this sort of detached outbuilding you can see in the rear garden um, is no longer there and the, the garden has since been landscaped. The proposed garage will have a um, ridge height of 3.15 metres and an eaves height of 2.15 metres. The garage will be dual pitched and constructed with natural stone to match the main dwelling. Additionally, the roof will be tiled with clay double Roman roof tiles that match the main property. The garage will measure approximately 5.6 metres by 6 metres and will be served by timber doors. So the top two photos show the site as approached from the southwest. And the um, bottom two photos show the site as viewed directly from the street. The top left shows the site as viewed from the northeast, and the top right shows the site from within the front garden area of the property. The bottom photo shows the existing driveway and the section of the wall that is to be removed and altered. So the proposed garage will be gabled, matching the main dwelling and character of the area. The building will project approximately 2.4 metres forward of the main front elevation of the property. However, this is considered acceptable due to the materials to be used and the distance of the garage from the road and this distance in comparison to other buildings in the road. The use of matching materials will prevent the garage to be visually jarring. While some of the natural stone wall will be removed, this will partially be replaced with some hedgerow and it is considered to not erode the character of the street scene as the section that borders the road and is most visible will predominantly remain. Whilst the proposed garage will be constructed along the boundary shared with the neighbour to the east, due, due, to, the, due to, the, to the west, sorry, not east, due to the orientation and size of the garage, it is not considered to result in an unacceptable level of overshadowing of the neighbouring property or other negative impacts of the neighbour's amenity. The proposal will result in the creation of additional off-road parking. The amendments sought to the boundary wall will not reduce the safety of the vehicular access. The ecologist has provided conditions to ensure that a bat box is installed to the garage and replacement hedgerow is planted. An informative will also be added to the consent to remind the applicant to not remove the hedgerow during the nesting seasons. Whilst the the application site lies within an area of high archaeological potential. Southwest Heritage is satisfied that there are no or limited archaeological implications. It is therefore recommended that permission is granted with conditions to protect ecological issues as set out in the officer's report. Thank you very much. 
again, we don't have any speakers on this particular application. So members, any, any comments or questions, please? I'm not seeing anything at the moment. Yeah, that's Councillor Gibson. Uh, yeah, I, I just is a question probably out of maybe a little bit stepped away from this application, but it would apply to it. Um, can we in any way ask for more enhancements of hedges on applications and things that, you know, if you've got to remove a hedge or you are taking out a hedge, like the one was passed earlier, um, can we not enhance that or have we just got to put back? I mean, I'm seeing bat boxes come up, which is great. Uh, just one single bat box and things. But I mean, the hedging's going back, but can it be, you know, we're, we're taking out one thing. Can we not put back two things in, in that sense? Because I think this is what should be happening on these where we're taking out, we're moving anything. I think the garage, you know, the ga look, the house looks fantastic. The garage is no pro I've got no problem with the garage. I mean, I'd rather put people in places rather than cars, personally. But um, uh, yeah, is that a, is that something that we can look at and do? Because this is important that we don't just take out one thing; we put back two or three things, because it's called in. That is enhancement. Um, just roof, you know, just putting something that back that might be new, and this might be an established hedge that's been there for you know it's been used for for years and to put back a new hedge i know a new hedge grows back grows quite quickly um but you know you, you get my drift anyway yeah Ms. Elvi, i don't know whether you want to come back on that but i've also got mr noon indicating as well so i don't know who wants to go first um adrian go first if you like <laughs> okay no worries mr noon um have you got q have you got the layout that you can put up yeah um, so obviously we have a condition that requires a replacement hedge uh, to be planted. Um, have you got a plan that shows where the wall is being removed? And and okay. Yeah. Um, Sorry, bear with me. So there we go. <laughs> the plan. Hold on, I've got photographs still. Uh, there we go. Right. I mean, we you, obviously we we have a little bit of uh, loss of the wall within the state that runs back from the road. Um, we've got the opportunity to do a, an area of planting of sort of hedgerow uh, within the front garden area. Presumably that probably just sort of your edge off the turning area. Um, so I think we can get you know, additional benefit here. Well, I suppose. We do need to bear in mind that this is a residential plot with a built up area. It's got sort of garden planting. Um, how appropriate it is to seek to control that through planning conditions um, in this context is, is probably the difficult issue here. Yes, we would like through a approval of a household application to get in uh, ecological enhancements, but those have to really to be reasonable to the level of development proposed and in this instance to get some bat boxes within the new garage and and some planting within the gar front garden area i think is reasonable um for this level of development if it was a new house we probably look at it a bit differently but for a householder application at an existing property i think this is a a reasonable balance of improvement to get you know, on the back of their additions to their property Ms. Elby, is there anything you wanted to add to that or you? No, no. said okay. what I was going to say. Thank you. Uh, I've then got Councillor Kingham and then Councillor Scott. So Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't have a, a, a problem with this. I think um, they've gone a long way. They've kept a very low roof line with the garage. It's all, so it doesn't um, overlook the neighbour property too much. They were just a little bit confused with the comments from the parish council. It says the boundary wall appears extremely close to the neighbouring property. While a boundary wall was, is not being moved, it's as it is. Uh, position of the garage, well, they have to put it where it is because obviously they need to have access to the rear 
and they a little bit of a concern of existing storm water be detrimental to the street scene but again it's it's meaning access into the uh, site to allow for driving in and and remove driving out on a forward gear which is correct um so i, I don't have a lot of problems with this and i would like to uh, move the recommendations chairman thank you very much uh, mr noon your hand is up is that a legacy one or is that you wanted to come back in uh, apologies legacy okay um Councillor Scott and then Councillor Hendry. Councillor Scott. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Um, it looks from the plan here that there will be an area of drive in front of the front lawn um, so the cars can reverse back there and then exit the property in a forward motion because um, the existing site plan looks as though they have to reverse out in the road, which I guess is dangerous, or reverse back into the building. So I think this is actually, you know, will be beneficial to this property. Um, I wonder if we, we need to put um, a provision on there that it will actually still be only retained as garage. Uh, Mr Noon or Ms Alvey? I, I would suggest on this that it, it is just a garage. It, it's not the substantial building we were looking at in the previous application. Um, I think the fear that they could create something unexpected, I think is highly unlikely here. Um, if members really had a concern about it, you could just say it should be limited to storage and or, and or parking of vehicles. Um, but realistically, it's it's the size of a large room. I don't think you know, there's any reasonable chance of anything utterly unexpected or that wouldn't be any commission occurring here. So in this instance, I don't think it, it, it it's necessary, but obviously members could. Uh, for peace of mind, ask us to do that. Could I also ask, Mr. Noon, if, if they were to come back for a change of use for that, I presume the loss of parking spaces would be something that we would have to take into account if if that was to be proposed. Uh, I uh, I think they've been they've been quite smart here in that they're showing the parking spaces in front of the garage. They're not relying on the garage to provide the parking space. So if they used it for storing bicycles and and so on and so forth, they would still have enough park. Um, so I, as I say, I don't see that there's anything likely to occur in here that we would be worried about okay. um, in terms of uh, the wrong use going in there. And obviously any change of use away from residential will always need planning permission anyway. Thank you. The next speaker I've got is Councillor Hendry. Good morning again, Mr Chairman. This after all, is only a double garage. It's, we're not talking about a two-storey property or anything like this. It, it is a two-storey garage. Sorry, a one-storey garage. It's not overlooking or impacting on any adjoining properties whatsoever. Absolutely nothing. Uh, so on that basis, I, I would like to second Councillor Stuart Kingham. Thank you. OK, any further comments or questions from members? I'm not seeing anything coming through. So we have before us a proposition which is to grant permission with as as per your report uh, with the conditions that are in place on the report. Uh, we'll start this time with uh, let's start with Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. I have listened and I've seen the whole application. I feel it is a well a good presentation by this uh, by this officer, and I have no hesitation in supporting I am for. Thank you, Councillor Kingham. Thank you, that, Chairman. Um, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I've um, listened to the whole debate, and I am for the recommendation. And Councillor Bradford. I've listened and heard the whole debate, Mr. Chairman. I'm for the recommendation. Councillor Bolt. I'm present throughout the whole debate and for the officer's recommendation. Councillor Perry. Yes, I've been present through the whole presentation, and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Yes, seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Glassford. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Seen and heard the whole debate and I am for. And Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Yep, seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. And Councillor Gibson. Yeah, hello. Um, I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Scott. 
Yes, I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Thank you. And Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Chairman. Seen and heard everything and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Seen and heard the whole debate, Chairman. I am for. And I've also seen and heard the whole debate and I'm also for. So again, Mr Nicholson, if you could confirm that's all members have voted. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Yeah, that's everybody and uh, that's unanimous. Yep, uh, Mrs Lehman, you agree? Yes, Chairman, I do agree. Thank you. Excellent. So that's clearly carried. So permission is, is granted. That brings us to the end of the uh, the applications that we have before us today. If we members can turn to your report sheets, uh, agenda item 8.1, which is the planning appeals received. Mr Noon, are you taking us through these? Yes, I can do. Um, so, uh, so obviously we got that, that first one addresses food. Um, obviously, the committee saw that a while ago. Um, obviously, the appeal in there. I don't know if anyone's got any particular queries about that one. Um, South View at Cossington. This is a, a CO2 infill opportunity um, that we felt didn't meet the basic requirements of CO2. Um, I think as part of the cluster is the issue there uh, which will I think as we found out this morning there's, there's, there can be quite a few views on what constitutes an infill site so an appeal decision will be forthcoming on that one. Okay any comments or questions from members on those two? Not seeing anything so if we move on to 8.2 which is the appeals decided. Um, so 69 Burley Drive. I think that one has been considered by committee probably about two years ago in another form. Um, applicant very keen to pursue all options there and another scheme dismissed. It's such a tight little site around the back of houses in a parking court. Um, I think the inspector was quite damning of the design as well as the location for a dwelling, um, but that must be about the second or third appeal on that site all dismissed. Thank you. Any comments or questions from members? No. OK, so we'll move on to 8.3, which is certificates of lawfulness. Yeah, so this one was issued. Um, I think it was just one day they, they provided extensive evidence to show that they had been using as, as a caravan park. They delineated the site so they have been doing a caravan park here and caravan storage there. Um, we didn't have any evidence to dispute that and their case was compelling. Uh, and the second one, the barn was, I guess. This one was um, a novel. Uh, it's an issue here that they said that they had used this building as a separate dwelling. I believe it was originally um, a holiday letter it should have been so they had to demonstrate that they had 10 years continuous breach of condition uh, there's been a, quite a few court cases on this recently as to what constitutes a sufficient gap in the breach so that the clock is reset and you've got to start your 10 years all over again um up until now well i, I was, it must have been about 10 months ago. The cake all calls to, you know, it had to be quite a, uh, a, a short break, um, wasn't sufficient. Um, but there are a case that's all said that, you know, even though, um, or something like this, even though there was, they didn't actually revert back to the lawful use, simply stopping the breach for only a short period of time that is three months was sufficient to break the the continuous breach and so in this case we we did see one um there was a clear breach and they stopped the 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 residential occupation and that was enough i suspect they may appeal that one um, because it was a sort of you know 
um, I, they felt that the, the, the break was so short that it didn't actually interrupt things. We uh, actually in the lot of moving on race law that it was a long enough break. So I understand one. Okay, I, I think I think Adrian, we got that. We, we we lost you a bit part way through, but I think it was basically you were saying that there's a there's an argument about the length of time that there was a break in the yeah. in the breach, Apologies. and therefore yeah, that that's what was felt to be long enough in our case. But you think it might be contested, and we'll wait for an appeal. Okay, yeah. There. Members, any other comments or questions? If not, that brings us to the end of our agenda this morning. So thank you all very much for your attendance and we'll close the meeting. So thank you very much. <laughs>